just like that, here we are. We are live with David Sedoni. And David, you are known as the how to buy a home guy. So we thought this would be on closing day, a very fitting interview. So thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Glad to know that I'm not the only one out in ether actually trying to talk to people about this. Trying to solve this problem of how to buy a home. Uh, we don't phrase it quite like that, but you do. And I love it. So um, before we jump into answering some of the hard questions that first time home buyers experience, can you help our listeners understand sort of how uh, you've been in real estate now 14 years, it sounds like, but how did you get started and how did you get interested in real estate? Well, my journey is uh, like many others who um, got interested in real estate during the last boom. Um, <laughs> there aren't that many that are actually left because there was also that little crash right afterwards. Yeah, that happened, didn't it? That happened. But um, I was kind of in a transitional phase in my career um, and was doing all right. So I started investing in real estate, uh, not knowing what I was doing at all. Didn't yeah. study any of the history, didn't study any of the timing and made a lot of money and thought I was a genius because it was 2002, 2003, 2004 and my right. stuff was doubling. Um, and then in 2005, I decided, you know, life, career, um, I wanted something a little more stable. So I went through that phase that people go through and my wife and I moved away from where my old uh, showbiz life was and uh, got out of Hollywood and I got into residential because the investing stuff was fun, but I, I like people more than I like numbers. Yeah. Uh, and then the crash happened. And uh, this is 2008, realized, 2009. It was actually for us, August, 2007. Oh really? Okay. The million dollar home, my first huge sale. Um, but it was this million dollar home that I sold that uh, in, in August 7th of 2007 in Orange County. And then three years later, the thing was worth like 750. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, but uh, because of the coaching program that I worked with right away, which uh, is referral based, um, yeah. and growing up in the part of Southern California that I live, I started talking to all my friends and family. Well, as 2007, 2008, everybody who wanted to buy a house but couldn't because all the news they were hearing was it's getting so expensive. Houses are doubling. Now they're hearing the sky is falling. The sky is falling. Next thing you know, I'm the new agent in my office, but I'm the first time buyer expert. Expert. I got 19 transactions with first time buyers because they're all my friends because they're just the right age. Right. They're just at that age where they've actually been able to save money instead of check comes in, rent goes out, student loans go out, car payment goes out. So they're, they're contacting you. Um, and that's cool. And so you've, that's how sort of you started as, okay, there's something to this first time home buyer, uh, audience that, that needs some help. How did you start to pick up on, there's this, there's this void out there. You, you mentioned just before the interview, like the ether, right? There's this void in the ether when it comes to first time home buying. How did that signal for you? And how did you know that there's something, there's something that needs to be discussed here? Well, it took time, uh, in the industry. Yeah not only listening to my clients, but really digging deep and watching uh, what the industry uh, teaches you as far as how to be a successful real estate agent. Um, mm -hmm. And it took my failures over and over and over again, not necessarily failure economically, but failure um, uh, uh, emotionally, uh, fulfillment wise. Mm -hmm. Um, I built teams. I hired at one point, I think we had eight buyer's agents when I was working with a partner. Wow. Um, and I went through, I did all the steps. I listened to all the seminars and all the people smarter than me in real estate and everybody, basically the first time buyer is the bottom of the totem pole. It's the training. It's truly the training for the agent. Like hmm. they'll, new agents get hired and the team or the office says, here, you go work with this person and learn how to be a real estate agent. Because that, they're a first time home buyer. Yes. Because wow. they're not worth my time or my money. The book I'm going to write today is called Real Estate Agents Think You Suck. First right. time. Because they, suck. they think that you suck their time, their money, and their energy, and nobody good wants to work with you. The whole goal of being a realtor for the top, top agents, it's to not be a realtor anymore. Hmm. It's to not even do the job. It's to own, to coach, and have other people do it for you. 
Mm-hmm. That's what's crazy. Think about that. Like I, I think in one of my podcasts, I said, think about like a heart surgeon whose goal was to just go out and write books and conferences about it, but not actually do it. Never actually do it. Yeah, that's really interesting. So the and best I'll realtors see, in the world are not time. the ones working with the first time home buyers. No, quite often it's new people. There's the, the opposite. On, on my podcast, uh, kind of jumping around a bit, but on my podcast, we call them unicorn agents. Um, they're that magical, mythical, elusive realtor who has experience and will actually give you the service that you need, but is willing to work with a first time home buyer. It's about 25%, I'm guessing. So, based on my years yeah. of looking at all that and seeing what was going on, I realized what a void there was. And I did a little bit about it. I did some seminars myself, um, I did a lot of teaching. Yeah. Uh, but not a lot. And then my wife went, dummy, why don't you do this? Yeah, and I make said, it happen. That's not what you do. The goal, the goal in the industry is to build a big team and is to up your average sales price. It's not to spend more time and more effort, more energy. Mm-hmm. And she's like, well, you always tell me they deserve it. Right. Yeah, that's really, that's a really cool story about, hey, this, they do deserve it. And so are you still, do you still help first time home buyers find homes or are you, are you focused solely on the education piece? No, uh, 2000, it started in March, 2019. And so um, I'm in a transitional phase right now. Great. Um, cool. uh, I, I still do my transactions. I usually do maybe about 50% of my transactions are first time buyers. Last year that bumped up to about 60 to 75. Yeah. Uh, because the podcast started to get some juice. Cool. Um, and then here we are in uh, January of 2020. Mm-hmm. But what I realized was I went from one or two a week, people contacting me to one a day from oh, all wow. the country because over the Christmas break, everybody either had some free time or was trying to avoid their family and <laughs> right. listen to podcasts. And so yeah. now I can't even keep up with it. So eventually I'm going to have to build this business into something um, using my nationwide network of realtors to help these people who want to be helped. And right. deserve it. Educating the ignored is, I think, how you phrased it uh, in your pre-interview questionnaire, and I, th- I thought that was really great. Uh, you know, uh, just a great sentiment. Um, you mentioned getting started in investing in real estate. What exactly were you doing? Were you flipping houses? Were you buying and holding uh, duplexes? What What did that look like? And and how did you? How was that sort of your first step into real estate? It seems like most people, you know, think, okay, I'm going to get a small one bedroom for myself, but t- had, had you approached it differently? I'm really curious about that. Yeah. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about where I am right now, um, 14th year in real estate and turning 50 this year is I, I've made a billion mistakes and <laughs> right. can tell everybody. That's how all you learn, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's the bit, that was one of my biggies. I can't, and I cannot tell you, I, I say every fifth or sixth person that reaches out to me for my podcast wants to invest first and buy huh. for them later. Um, We had a small condo that we were living in. And uh, rather than thinking about moving up and investing in my own place, uh, because that was such the buzz, um, I looked all around the country for single families. I didn't know enough about duplexes. And so we got into single family rentals. One of them turned into a flip. One of them turned into a long hold that recovered. Ah. Where in the country was that? We looked in Florida, we looked in yeah. uh, Vegas, and we looked in Phoenix. Okay. We ended up going in, in the Phoenix area. What's hysterical is I was so young. Back then, if I look at it, that's the joke now. It's like, oh, 2003, 2004, you bought houses in Vegas or Phoenix? Yeah, yeah. you everyone else. Because the market's crashed, and if I'd done any studying, I would have known that. But I didn't. So for someone listening that says, okay, David is this real estate expert. He's talking about doing some studying to understand the markets. Are there things that people can do as a first time home buyer to, to better understand like everyone's saying the market is high, right? You mentioned this, the sky is falling, but are there places you recommend a first time home buyer go to get some of this information? It's so difficult, but I think, yeah. I think the first and simplest way is to truly go broad and basic. Hmm. And yes, things are different. That's for sure. But you need to understand how this all works for the past 50 years. 
Yeah. Go back and look at, because if you believe that housing is a stable, long-term piece of your life from the financial side, then you have to understand, you have to go back and, and, and show yourself that data. Then once you do that, you then you can get down to the micro and realize that right now we're in this crazy perfect storm. Actually, six, seven years ago was the crazy perfect storm when right. prices were low, rents were screaming and going up in our area 10% a year, and wow. interest rates were sitting like, you know, below five. Right. That's the perfect storm. And it, what's happening now is interest rates have dropped, you know, they're in the threes, prices have gone up. But if you do that monthly number, it's actually the same place we were three years ago. So it's the affordability index you look at. That's what changes why this is so incredible. Yeah. But you have to go and look at, you know, Housing Wire is an industry insider one. Um, but the key is talk to your own uh, realtor professional. Find a unicorn in your area and mm -hmm. have them disperse the information. Half of what I do is I read 15 articles and then I send my clients summaries of all 15. Of those. Right. Doing the hard work that you're like the cliff note version for home buying. Because it's too much, but you have to know it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with home prices so high, that is a concern. I'm sure you hear this all the time that I can't save the 20%. I, you know, I'm, I'm working a job. I'm working as hard as I can. How do I get there? Uh, do you recommend that some of your first time home buyers look at purchasing a duplex and living in half, uh, figuring out how to rent out rooms in Airbnb? Do you have those discussions with folks and, and what does that look like? Well, that's two different financial discussions and arguments. Yeah. And okay. 20% versus what I call house hacking. Okay. They're two different discussions and, uh, uh, I have a lot of people that have done really great in life and saved a ton of money because of Dave Ramsey. And I love him. And truth be told, I'd love to be the first time buyer, Dave Ramsey, and have that be what I do. But I completely disagree with him on the 20%. Interesting. You say do not put down the 20%. There, I would say for about 80 to 85% of the people who I talk to, I can run the math for you right now and show you that 3.5% down versus the rent that you're paying yeah. Versus uh, not uh, also including the tax benefits that you're going to get. Okay, raise your hand out there if you're bored at what I just said. Do you want me to call <laughs> the whiteboard? Trust me, the math works. Yeah. Three and a half percent down on a three hundred thousand dollar house. All right. So now you're looking ten, eleven grand, right? Yeah. Put down there plus your closing costs. Let's take it up to fifteen thousand dollars. Sure. Okay. So you can get into a house, a three hundred thousand dollar house for fifteen thousand dollars. That might cost you fourteen, fifteen hundred bucks a year, a month in rent. Uh huh. Okay. Yep. If you're renting someplace for twelve hundred dollars, and you're like, I'm gonna save into this other sixteen and a half percent. How many years is it gonna take you to save sixteen and a half percent? Could be a lot on a three hundred thousand dollar house. Yeah, I gotta save thirty, forty, fifty grand. Right? That's right. going to take a long time to save. Every year that you own the house, you're going to get a two, three, four thousand dollar tax benefit. Every year that you own the house, you're going to be paying rent instead or mortgage instead of a rent and yep. potentially getting appreciation. Right. right. Experts are talking the next two to three years, we're looking at appreciation unless we hit some sort of crazy global recession. And right. in case that happens, you can't even be a naysayer to study the history because three out of the last five recessions housing has increased. Interesting. Because one of the main things they do is they try to push down the Fed when we go through a recession and that helps mortgage rates and then housing actually increases. Captain boring, but I believe this in the good stuff. stuff though. This is good. This is why, this is why I think some folks listen. They, they like the weeds. They like to get, they like to get into, okay, here's why, here's what I need to save and here's the math behind it. Are there instances where you talk to a first time home buyer and say, not for you. Oh yeah. Just had one a uh, uh, couple days ago. Yeah. Uh, talk about that. What does that, what does that look like? Well, the, the general answer is everybody can buy a home. It's just a matter of when mm -hmm. that's the general answer. So a lot of times I talk to people and I'm like, no, you shouldn't do this. Um, if I'm talking to someone and we're doing the three and a half percent down scenario that we just went through and they're living in their mom's basement and they like it <laughs> right. and rad, 
stay there forever and save the money. Continue saving. Because um, again, getting back into the weeds, what that three and a half percent scenario does to the 20% scenario, a lot of people say they don't want to, they don't want to pay PMI. Yeah. Uh, private mortgage insurance. If right. you're That's a concern for some folks. It, yeah. You have to pay a couple hundred bucks a month and people are like, well, I'm not doing that. And I'm like, okay, genius. This thing we just did, it's going to take you eight years to save $50,000 right. to get 20%. How about you just loan yourself $50,000 for $200 a month mm -hmm. and you get eight years of tax benefits. You get eight years of potential appreciation and it's fixed. Rents are going up three to four to five percent, ten percent where I live in Southern California. Mathematically, it almost never works against it. And the house hacking thing that yeah. you were talking about, a lot of times you you have to qualify for the entire mortgage. So if you right. can't afford the mortgage, but mom and dad co-sign, you guys can afford something, but you feel like that's gonna be too much, maybe someone's going to go on maternity leave next year and your income's going to get cut in half. So you're like, well, uh -huh. we can really buy a smaller house. Mm -hmm. Individually, everyone has to think about it, but uh, globally, everyone has to at least have all the information so that you can have expanded options to choose from, as opposed to just grandma and grandpa said, put 20% down and stay in the house for 30 years. Right. David, that's really, that's really insightful when it comes to that 3% versus 20% and then who is it, you know, who is it right for? And more importantly, who is it maybe wrong for? Um, yeah. If let's say someone approaches you and has $50,000 saved, they have 20% down payment and they're ready to purchase a home with you. Uh, do you then also recommend that, Hey, save, keep some of that money on the sidelines and only put 3% down or if they've, or you're only recommending that they save 20%. If it, if they, if they put down the 3%, if it means, the other option is waiting five years to put down 20%. I would absolutely love to have a blanket statement to that, but everybody is individual. Yeah. Um, and that sounds like a cop out, but what I'm really telling you is don't believe all the other crap out there that says, click this button. We have all the answers. There is right. no way to answer to that and know that a generalization could be in that particular scenario. I don't know if I'm talking somebody out of 20% down especially yeah. where we are right now in, in see, but again, it depends how long are they going to stay in the property? Right. They're, you know, if we're at the top now, if, if we're at a nine, 10 year run in housing, that's double what it should be. So mm -hmm. we're anticipating a flattening coming in the next few years. If you're telling me we're going to leave in three years, that was a conversation I just had the other day. I was talking to someone who is getting a job transfer um, to Southern California in six months, but it's only for three years. Yeah, he ran the numbers, and I I might recommend he rent while he's in Southern California during sure. the years. Mm -hmm. But saving the real, uh, getting super weedy here. But the <laughs> yeah. real interesting thing is when people talk to me about three and a half percent down versus five percent down or ten percent down. Yeah, that's where I recommend more that we go to the three and a half percent and dave ramsey is pulling his hair out freaking out there's a bunch of other people around there going that i sound like a slimy salesperson just trying to get people in at three and a half percent down no i've studied this it's the current perfect storm this will not be the same when interest rates change right this when, will not be the same if they take away the tax benefits yeah. but the way it is right now why would you, if you had the opportunity to put 15% down or $15,000 down in that $300,000 scenario we were talking about, that's closing costs and everything. Sure. Why bump it up to 30% or, or to $30,000 down uh, to save $5 a month or $10 a month? Would you rather have an extra $50 a month off of your mortgage or would you rather have $15,000 in the bank? Right. Well, $20,000 in the bank or $80,000 in the bank. Yeah. That's the difference between three and a half percent down and 10% down. That's where I really recommend liquid is key because if you have 10% down in a house and something happens, what's the only way to get that money out of the house? You got to sell it. You got to sell it. Or you got to get a home equity line of credit, which is the whole reason the last housing crash happened. Well, right. People leveraging their existing homes. House ATMs. What do you say about that? You're against home equity lines of credit. Don't do it. Don't do it. 
That's the Dave Ramsey. Well, there's Dave Ramsey, the, the side of you that uh, loves Dave Ramsey. That's, that makes sense. Yes. And, and everybody, and everybody, well, I also have inside knowledge. Everyone wants to talk about the predatory lending that was the, the 2007, 2008 crash. Right. Yeah, that's, that's true. But you know the staff that nobody talks about? Hmm. All my lines of credit didn't start too long ago. Okay. And by the time we got to 2000, I think it was from the 80s. Okay. By the time we got to 2000, there were $60 billion in home equity line of credit. 60 billion. 60 billion. Okay. So then, but so you figure how many it, over 25, 30 years it took to get to 60 billion. In just six years, that number jumped in 2006 to $626 billion. That's how much America had to their home because they were seeing all the houses around them doubling and tripling in a year or doubling yeah. in a year and everybody took money out of their house and everybody had you know it's a visual medium here but for your listeners imagine taking your hands and bringing them together that's how tight the equity is you yeah. want a big space there right. so that's again completely boring and not helpful to anyone trying to buy their first home but realize Understanding all these pieces and having an advocate behind you that understands all these pieces will help you get creative and also keep you safer. It's scary, totally. but the more we talk about the creative stuff, the safer you actually are because just picking the boring regular path might be putting a ton of money into a house when you could be holding that money in a savings account where you can actually have access to it. Yeah. Yeah. And some it's uh the the finance piece of saving saving for a house and then once that once that cash is you know tied up in a home um those are things that sometimes people don't think about that oh now you know i did have all this money and it it was this emotional um safety net for me that if something happened i had all this cash on the sidelines and then that does become equity and i think that's where the home equity line of credit conversation is important for a first time home buyer to hear that this it's going to feel like, okay, that emotional burden is, is maybe, oh, it's just a house ATM, but um, being really cautious before you, before you make that decision. Yeah, I always recommend to everybody, stretch and get more house than you think in the beginning, because most of the time when I'm talking to people, people are young and they have an income ladder that is going up, not down. Sure they're going to get tax benefits. That's going to make that monthly number. If you pay $2,000 a month right now, you can probably pay $2,400, $2,500 a month with zero change to your monthly budget. Right. And that's a whole podcast I have on that. But then what I see happen is people get two or three years in and they, and they read an article about, oh my God, I didn't realize my $300,000 house after 30 years is actually going to cost me $515,000 when you add all the interest. Right. And they start trying to throw an extra payment. And I'm like, whoa, 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 do you have six months reserves? Yeah. Get your and emergency fund ready to go. Out of this check. Right. Keep your reserves. It's, it's, it's all about stretching and then having a reserve behind it and staying conservative and sitting and living and existing in the most convenient and conservative investment that we have in our country. Bars of gold mm -hmm. are fantastic not comfortable to sleep on. <laughs> right. Right. Um, David, this is, this is really great. Can you, you know, our last, my last question before we jump into to closing time, can you give some advice for folks that are, uh, you know, saving up that money, um, they're renting and they're deciding, you know, the responsibility of owning, I've heard, okay, the kitchen sink breaks. It's, it's my responsibility now when I'm the owner, uh, I'm renting. I just call the landlord. Um, I saw that you recently wrote a blog post or maybe it was uh, in kind of the middle of 2019 about renting versus owning. Can you just provide some insights to our, to our listeners who ha are having that question, who are sort of tackling that question themselves? It's, I mean, you talk about the basics for what we do in real estate and that's part of the reason why I started the podcast and, and wanted first time buyers to hear the right information because it sucks that they're hearing information from people that, are not experienced because the whole goal in real estate is get good and then leave the first time buyers to the rookies. Yeah. Um, and this is, this is the basic most instrumental question of real estate. Well, why should I, why should I? And, and you know what? A lot of times people ask me that and I go, I know you, man, you are a lifelong renter. 
So <laughs> chill for 600 bucks a month. Right. But no, you are liking it. You... Yeah. I was just saying for the past 10, 15 years, rents are going up like crazy and you can't control that. Right. So although you might think I have to fix my sink, um, you know, I'm, I'm shocked at how many people don't realize that a home warranty is traditionally a standard piece. And that for the first year, the seller should pay in most standard transactions, depending on how it's negotiated for you to have a warranty. Now mm -hmm. it's the car warranty and you know how those go. You think you're bumper to bumper and then they go, eh. but you know what? Your dishwasher yeah, sure. breaks most of the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in general, again, it all comes down to the big math. The big math shows that I can tell you that right now, you know, I went back and looked at these seminars um, and, you know, PowerPoint presentations that people were talking about renting versus owning, how renting is more expensive than owning back when interest rates were at 8%. Wow. wow. Yeah. And, and now at 3%, and, those, those arguments get much stronger. Yeah, absolutely. So in general, the, the fixed portion of having your rent not move for 30 years if you're out there right now and you're thinking, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to have to fix my own kitchen sink, I say, cool, take your rent up by 5% a year for the next 20 years and tell me if your job is going to pay 5% more a year for the right. next 20 years. And if that difference or if that is worth not, you know, grabbing a wrench and getting your hands dirty. Yeah, exactly. Or doing, doing what I do. Uh, I get my hands dirty by calling somebody on my phone. Calling an expert who knows what they're doing okay. before you flood your kitchen. Yes. If you're right. freaked out about doing it because you don't, or you're not handy, <laughs> yeah, you should come hang out with me and many of my first time home buyers. You don't have to know how to fix something. Don't be afraid because you don't know how to use a screwdriver. Right. You know, you I find can't someone that does either. It doesn't mean I shouldn't drive. Right. Right. Um, yeah, it's a great, great analogy. Um, so let's, let's jump into our closing segment, which we lovingly call closing time. This is the part, David, where we ask you a couple of questions that we try to ask every guest. Um, the first being, if you had sort of one piece of advice for a first time home buyer that is just struggling to get started, can you, can you give them sort of what's your first step? If they haven't reached out to anybody yet, they're just sitting at home thinking, Five percent a year, that sounds awful. What is my first step? Well, I'm gonna go a little against the grain. Shock, right? Surprise, surprise. Um, I uh and it's been interesting because listening to your podcast, um, I got to hear from a lot of great lenders. One of the reasons why I started my podcast was because I Googled first time home buyer when my wife gave me this idea. I got 19 pages before I gave up because I did not see one realtor. Wow. And if you listen to my podcast, I, I'll go deeper into this. But my one big piece of advice is to tell you this. If you research this, you're going to find a thousand things that say I'm wrong. I'm not. Go to a realtor first and a lender second. Mm -hmm. Everything online is going to tell you real uh, lender first. Mm -hmm. Everything. You are going to not find anything that agrees with me then go find a realtor with more than 10 years experience who dedicates his life to first-time buyers when you find that person see what they say oh wait i'm the only one <laughs> you you can find you can find one person that says this his name is david it's realtor first lender second and there is a whole mountain of proof and reasoning behind this yeah. uh, be uh but the lending market has figured out how to, haha, <laughs> surprise, surprise, market hmm. all those people out there. And all those people out there are starting to use their smartphones. And for some reason, they think that Rocket Mortgage, I can go get a, the biggest financial transaction of my life by going like this. Oh, tap. Boop. Right. Ridiculous. Yeah. It, it does seem a bit, a bit crazy. Um, just how simple it can be to get $300,000 in debt. Yeah. Or how yeah. fast it can be. Yeah. Um, and so, so the fact that you can, that, that's my biggest piece of advice is, um, and the reason why it doesn't, doesn't work for a lot of people is because 75% of the realtors don't want to talk to you if you need two years of financial planning. Right. They want to get in the car with you on Saturday with someone who's going to buy in 30 days. 
So when you find that unicorn person that's got 25%, they can show you what houses are. Then you can decide how much to save. If you talk to a lender first, you're saving with no clue because Zillow can give you some, but not the full picture. So the biggest piece of advice I give to people is find a realtor first that's willing to work with you. And then they have a team that is dedicated to them. As a realtor, it sounds narcissistic, but people do better work for me because I'm the bread and butter. The Mm -hmm. lender person, the inspector person, the trades person, I bring all the clients to them. So now you have a lender that I just didn't call a call center and got pushed down the line. Now I have a lender that I just didn't look up online and press click and get the first salesperson to call me back. Now I have a lender that has a vested interest in doing an awesome job with me because they were referred to that lender through a realtor who if Mm -hmm. we're both satisfied, I will continue to refer the lender. Yes. Realtor first, lender second, folks. You heard it here first from David Sidoni. 12 seconds. that's that's really cool uh, it's nice getting competing views you know i think it it's uh it's something for folks to work out and what what do they want to do but i think you make a strong argument for realtor first lender second so thank you for that uh let's let's talk about books that you might recommend for first time home buyers it can be financial uh you know financial literature it can be uh real estate it can be life what what would you recommend somebody pick up if they're interested and curious about this topic? Uh, I just got a DM from somebody who mentioned that they read this really simple little book, Hmm. um, which is a a budgeting basic book that again, everything that I distribute, some of it's learned, most of it is regurgitation. A a really smart guy told me about this book called The Richest Man in Babylon. It's written written in parallel form. Yeah, I've heard of this. It's ancient style of 70 10 10 10 yeah Um, and my kids have piggy banks and when they get a dollar 70 cents goes into spend 10 percent goes into save 10 percent goes into invest and uh and then the other um let's see save uh, save invest is it give invest charity yeah yeah okay cool richest man in babylon folks look it up uh, yep. I hear oh, that. I hear that book come across quite a bit. Yeah, it's it, the guy who runs my coaching program uh, recommends it, but it's it's kind of like Think and Grow Rich. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's one of those staples that's been around forever. Um, if you're really deep into it, Tony Robbins has a couple new books that are that are really good on okay. stock market finance stuff. But um, this, he's got a few books, but he's also got a great online presence. Anyone out there struggling with student debt and thinking that that's the reason it's holding you back, look up Adam Carroll. Adam Carroll. Okay. He did a movie a couple of years ago, Broke, Busted, and Disgusted. Yeah. Um, but he is the leading authority on student debt, and there are a lot of people that aren't even listening to anybody because they're letting debt hold them back. Yeah. So I think he needs to be lifted up in our society over the next few years so people don't get scared of homeownership. Cool definitely make sure to throw those in the show notes. So thanks for that. Um, and lastly, David, how can people find out more about you? How to buy a home. It's a podcast. Search it. Uh, we're lucky enough to be at the top of the charts, but this is a podcast. And when you listen to this in 2023, who knows? Uh, okay. But um, How to Buy a Home is the podcast. My website is my name, David Sidoni, S-I-D-O-N-I. And you can get everything there. Um, a lot of people like to find me on Instagram. Okay. So if you're a grammar, David Sedoni, and Sedoni. Uh, I am on Facebook at how to buy a home guy also. Uh, Excellent. That's where you can find me. And a lot of people will find me through the podcast. They DM me and then I send them to my website and then they send me an email from the website. And just like that, I'm hooking them up with a unicorn across the country to help them, whether they're 30 days, 30 weeks or 30 months away from buying a house, yep. the sooner you start your plan, then A, the better plan you'll have in action, and B, the faster it actually happens and you can stop throwing away rent. But most people, not their fault, because I'm the only voice screaming out there, uh, most people wait too long and they try to save and reduce their debt on their own 
and don't realize that there's a delicate equation with that. Yeah. I had people who think they're doing all the right things and then they go to, and then they do that for a year and then they go to an open house and then they call me and go, I found this awesome open house. We did everything right for a year. And if they called me a year ago, we could have bought a house 25% more than that house and done it six months earlier. Right. They'd be six months ahead of the game. Totally. And in a better financial position. You don't know what you don't know. Don't know what you don't know. What better words to end a podcast on first time home buying than you don't know what you don't know. David, thank you so much for your time. This has been truly insightful and we really appreciate it. I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Thank you very much for being another voice of, of real earnest help for these people who really need it and deserve it. Thank you. Great. Thanks.